All right, good morning. If you turn in your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 11. Today we're in part two of a three-part series that I simply call Faith Begins at Home, and that is Living by Faith. Today we're in chapter 11, verses 4 to 6. I grew up Roman Catholic, and until 18 years old, I was a nominal Catholic, which meant that my family went to Christmas and Easter and occasionally to a bingo game. But by the time I was 18 years old, uh, my dad no longer went to church, and he was golfing pretty much every Sunday. And my mom, who had grown up in an abusive and oddly religious home, uh, had given up on any form of organized religion. And so it was a big surprise to everyone in the home, not the least of which was myself, that God, had, uh, when I turned 18 years old, that God determined to save me. And so it was one night uh, at Reston Bible Church over in Reston, Virginia, that I went as an 18-year-old to their youth group and heard for the first time the gospel preached. And God had been working on my life. He had been convicting me of my sins. And that night, I trusted in Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Well, it was exciting. I went home and I learned a few things. My life completely changed. And I went to talk to my parents about what great stuff had just happened to me. Even as nominal Catholics, they just looked at me funny. And I kept telling them, God did this, and it was by grace, and it was faith, and all this. And over the course of a couple of months of them being kind to me, they finally had a meeting that I did not hear about till years later. And in that talk, my mother said to my dad, John, I'm worried about David. I think he's in a cult. <laughs> and that night, my dad and my mom decided that my dad would come to the cult and he would try to extract me from it. So a couple of Sundays later, my dad announces to me on a Sunday morning, I'm going with you to church this morning. Well, I'd been praying for my dad, and of course I'd been witnessing to my parents, and I was like, this is awesome. And so my, my dad gets in the car, we go to the church service, we do the whole service, we get back in the car, and my dad and I were good at conversing, so it was kind of unusual my dad didn't say much on the way home. And I was like, hey, how'd you like it this morning? And he was like, that was good. You know, I'm glad I went this morning. And that was it. And all week long, I didn't hear a word from him. So I just determined, okay, that was it. That was the one time my dad's going to church. But the next Sunday, same thing. I'm going to church with you this morning. So we go to church, we sit through the service. And at the end of the service, I can't find my dad. And when I do find him, we're about to walk out the door. He's holding a stack of books presumably from our Christian bookstore at our church. And so we get in the car, and he looks at me, and he says, well, David, I'm not going to be golfing on Sunday mornings anymore. And I was like, why? And he said, because I got saved this morning. God, in his glorious grace, second Sunday my dad goes to church, walks out of there knowing he's a saved man. And so now my mom has a real problem. everybody's in a cult. <laughs> well, over the next couple of years, my dad and myself, we witnessed to my mom, of course, and until my dad passed away. And my mom still did not show any signs of interest in the gospel. So after my dad's death, I went to visit my mom one time to talk to her again about the gospel. We sat at her dining room table and we talked and got through all the gospel, explained it, she asked some questions, and then she had a really clear response. And her response was 180 from my father's response. She said four things to me. I never want to hear this again. You're not my son. You need to leave my home and never talk to me again. And so for the next 10 years, our relationship was basically on that premise. Uh, I called, I attempted to get in on it. My mom would take a few of my calls, we'd have very basic talks. 
very, pretty much nothing. And for 10 years, I pretty much did not see my mom. And so many of you have been through those kind of things. But in God's, and I'll finish the story because it's helpful to know that so it won't leave you with a cliffhanger the rest of this message. But in God's glorious grace also, that when my mom was 94 years old and failing in health, but quite clear in her mind, I had the privilege again of going through the gospel with her and invited her to the reunion to be with my brother and my dad and myself and others who'd come to Christ in our family and explained the gospel again. And God's goodness, she responded that she wanted to be there and she understood it was by faith in Christ alone. And so my hope in all of that is that she has come to faith and that I will see her again in heaven. Well, in all of that, I understand what it means that within the family, we often have great division rather than great peace in our extended families over the gospel. And as you start 2023, I'm aware of stories, even in my months here, of many of you have shared with me about a brother or a sister who doesn't know the Lord, or a husband or a wife who doesn't know the Lord, or children who don't know the Lord. And in many cases, it's not that they're atheists, but rather they're just religious in a different direction, which in some ways makes it even harder. What I find here in Hebrews 11 interesting that the very first character mentioned here in Hebrews 11 is Abel. Now, chronologically, he's the first. He's the first martyr. But more than that, it's the idea that faith begins at home. That what we find in the first three characters that are mentioned with Abel, with Enoch, and then with Noah, that all of them have experiences, spiritually speaking, that relate to home. And that faith is first tested there. And sometimes it's first born there. But friends, the greatest test of faith as we begin this chapter is the very thing of what will you do with the gospel if people in your family do not believe or persecute you or shun you or do whatever they're going to do because of the gospel? This is the experience of Abel. And so let's read verse 4 first, and then we'll explain. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous or justified. God testifying about his gifts or offerings or sacrifice, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. We don't have any recorded words of Abel in the Bible, but we're told here that he is speaking to us today. He is the first martyr. He has sibling rivalry that leads to persecution that eventually leads to his martyrdom. And so I need to give you a little bit of context to Hebrews one more time. We'll read the Genesis text to understand and look at the life of Abel's faith relative to how God uses that in our own lives with our own unbelieving or sometimes overly religious family members. The background of this text is pretty simple. They're Jewish professing believers who are receiving this letter from the author, and they are being shunned by their families. They are being excommunicated from the synagogue, and they are now tempted to go back because of the loss of family and faith community. Also, they're under the persecution now of Rome. Now, according to the author of Hebrews, there has been no shedding of blood in this congregation. No one has died yet because of this, but the Nero persecution and the rising uh, attacks from the synagogue are pinnacling up now to a point in this book where they're about to suffer martyrdom, perhaps. In that, they're tempted to go back. And so the author is writing to them and starts out with Abel and says, Abel had family problems, but he maintained his faith even in the midst of such persecution. And so let's read the Genesis account in chapter 4 of Genesis, verses 1 to 10, and you can turn there if you'd like, but Genesis 4, 1 to 10, to understand what exactly happened between Abel and Cain and why God approved of Abel's sacrifice but did not receive Cain's. 
Genesis 4, verses 1 to 10. Now the man, that is Adam, had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Now this is a big deal actually, and it is this. Because in a minute we'll explain more fully, but you remember that after the fall of Adam and Eve, God had made them two promises. Promise one, there's someone coming who will crush Satan's head and be your redeemer. He's going to take care of the sin problem. And secondly, he had pictured in the form of taking an animal skin and putting it on Adam and Eve that there'd be a blood atonement or there'd be a sacrifice for their sins. These pictures are in their mind and Eve is thinking that God has just given her the chosen one. Cain is the answer to God's promise in chapter three. So when she says, the Lord has given me a man child, she's not just excited about birth. Adam and Eve think, this is it. God sent us the savior, the chosen one. As a parent, you will understand Adam and Eve's dilemma when he ends up being the devil. The very opposite of what they think is about to happen. So in verse two of Genesis four, again, she gave birth to his brother Abel and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Apparently, God is not a vegetarian. And so people are confused. Why didn't God take Cain's offering? We'll look then at verse 6 or verse 5. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. And then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, that is, if you bring the right sacrifice, will not your countenance be lifted up, that is, by God, who will approve of him? And if you don't do well and you do what you just did, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you to take over, but you must master it. Cain told Abel, his brother, stop there. Wouldn't you like to know what he told him? Since we know that Cain is about to kill his brother, you might infer things like this. Cain says, okay, Mr. Jesus freak, you just made me look bad in front of God and the family. I'm the older brother. Hey, Mr. Religious guy who brings the special offerings, I wasn't impressed. You're making me look bad. We don't know what he said, but there's a sibling rivalry over religion. The first person killed in the Bible was over religion. The religion of man and kills God's prophet. And so, verse 8. So Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. How did they know what to bring? Why is God angry with Cain? Why doesn't he just say, Cain, good job. You brought some good stuff here. Good job. Well, there are at least five things I would say that we need to understand about Cain and Abel that they were perfectly aware of what they were supposed to bring. See, Abel's faith is not, I wonder if God will be pleased with this. I have faith that he'll receive it because I think it's good. But rather, faith is always trusting in what God has already said and acting upon it. Here are some things that I would say. Number one, they had the promise of a redeemer in Genesis 3, right? Cain and Abel would certainly be aware from Adam and Eve that there's a redeemer that's been promised who's going to crush the head of Satan, who's going to redeem them. Secondly, they had the picture, as I've already noted, of the animal skin that had been placed on Adam and Eve as a blood sacrifice. 
If they only knew those two things, that God had demanded blood sacrifice, they would be in line with what Hebrews 9 will eventually tell us, and namely, there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. This is a principle from that very first all the way through Scripture. There is no atonement. There is no pleasing God or taking his wrath away without the shedding of blood. They knew that and that there was a redeemer coming. At the end of the day, Cain doesn't believe that. Cain doesn't believe in the redeemer coming. He doesn't believe there's a need for blood atonement. And he brings man's best religion. But thirdly, they had parents, right? (laughs) I mean, think about it. There's Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. Now, we know other brothers and sisters are going to be born here. It's a small family. Adam and Eve had personally seen God in the garden. They were the people. They weren't even telling a story about something that happened. Their parents obviously told them what the requirements would be. And then fourthly, in this picture, we already know that Abel is a prophet. Jesus says in Luke chapter 11, the following words, so that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation from the blood of Abel, right, to the blood of Zechariah. Abel's the first prophet in the Bible. What is a prophet? He's a spokesman for God. God had already revealed, apparently, to Abel some things were not privy to what those were, but Abel was God's spokesman at the day. Can you imagine how Cain felt about that? Cain's the older brother, and he's got the preaching brother. I was the youngest of four. After I came to faith in Christ, I had my three siblings above me, and they're like, not impressed. Joseph of many colors. So now you're the saved one. And then fifthly, They must have had personal communication from God directly. That's my assumption from the text. A couple of things. In Genesis 4 that we just read, God says to him, now if you do well, you you know that's going to go well. This is not just at the end. God has already instructed them somehow to say, Cain, you already know what you're supposed to have brought. And basically we know that as a prophet, he must have received, that is, Abel must have received instruction from God. So what did they know? Bring a blood sacrifice but not to get saved by it. But it's a picture of believing that the saving one is coming. Do you understand that? If you get nothing else in the room today, they weren't given things to do to earn merit, but they were things to do to explain that they were symbols of a belief that a forward account was taking place, that God would send this savior, this redeemer. Apparently, Enoch, I'm I'm sorry, apparently Cain does not believe in all of this. So how did they know that the uh, offering was accepted? I mean, they put it down and it was like, not accepted, you know? I mean, how do they know? Uh, One of two things comes to mind. Number one, maybe God just told them directly, and we don't have that in the text. And number two, we know that in the Old Testament, there are a number of times when an offering is given, and there might be a question about its authenticity, and then God would send fire from heaven to consume the offering. Uh, Think of Judges chapter six. Then the angel of the Lord put on the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. What did God do to tell him that it was approved and not approved? Don't know, but they knew very clearly that it was not approved. So here's the bottom line. Why did God accept Abel's offering and he did not accept Cain's? And what are the implications for family life? And What's the implication of a life of faith? Well, pretty simply, uh, Abel's accepted for two very clear reasons. He had faith and he brought the right offering. He had faith and he brought the right offering. Now, the question is not, or the point is not, that he had a feeling of faith. This morning, you're not pleasing the Lord more by having more feelings of faith. I believe it more today. But rather, the faith that they had, they were acting upon. He believed that the Messiah was coming. Therefore, he brought a blood sacrifice. 
it's all the idea of doing the right thing for the right reasons. We, we go through that all the time in our, our faith. We either do the right things for the right reasons, or we do the right things for the wrong reasons, or we do the wrong things for the right reasons, or we do the wrong things for the wrong reasons. Scripture's full of those stories. And let me give you a couple examples. Abel does the right thing for the right reason. He brings the sacrifice God said. That's what faith is. God said it, I'll do it. But he does it by faith, which is I believe God and I trust God. And so he does it for the right reasons. But it's also possible to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. Baptism, water baptism that we talked about class today, or taking communion. Those are the right things to do. But you can take them thinking you're gaining merit with God, right? You can take them thinking, God owes me one, man, I got baptized. No, you just got wet, okay? You, you, nothing happened there. Also, you can do the wrong thing the right way or for the right reasons. My favorite story on that, and I would like to talk about it in a few minutes, a little longer, but Uzzah in the Old Testament. You remember that King David wanted the Ark of the Covenant taken from the Philistines who stole it, brought back to Jerusalem, and so there's a big party on the way, and they're, they're praising the Lord, and they got all kinds of music going. And along this cart, which was not built correctly, they had the Ark of the Covenant on it, as you know. And Uzzah is one of the guys walking by the, by the cart. The oxen stumble. It looks like the ark is going to fall off, apparently. And Uzzah reaches out to keep it from falling. Now, look, if we didn't know the whole story and we just saw that part, all of us would reason that he did the right thing. You don't want the ark of God to fall on the ground. But there's a little problem, right? God had said, anybody who touches the ark dies. So he did the wrong thing but let's give him, he did it for the right reason. We don't know that. But he might not have wanted God, to, his glory to fall to the ground. But it was the wrong thing in worship. And for Ionly, you can do the wrong thing for the wrong reason. Cain is the perfect example. Wrong sacrifice, not a blood sacrifice. He just brings what he wants to bring to God. And he does it for the wrong reasons. Let me explain why I know that. In 1 John chapter 3, we know a little bit about Cain such a good guy. For this is the message, it says, which you have heard from the beginning, that we are to love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one. Cain was not just having a bad religious day, right? The story, in, the story isn't just, hey, Cain brought the wrong offering, it was a bad day. But next week, he brought the right offering. Cain was from the evil one. In fact, his whole line will then be demonstratively evil in so many ways. And he murdered his brother. And for what reason did he murder him, according to 1 John 3? Because his own e deeds were evil, but his brothers were righteous. And then it says, do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. In your extended family, it is very possible that there are those who hate you, despise you, make fun of you, belittle you, shun you, because you believe what God says. And you've decided that by faith, you're going to serve the Lord and live by faith. I remember a conversation I had with my brother John right after I became a Christian. And we were driving somewhere in New Jersey for some reason. And we we're driving along and he was finding about my new faith. And he said, uh, let me ask you a question, Dave. I was like, okay. He said, if the Bible said that Jesus wore red ball sneakers, would you believe it? Well, I was 18 years old. I've been a Christian like three weeks. I don't know. And I was like, well, if the Bible said it, I would, even though it was absurd. And he's like, that's my problem. You people will believe anything. But my brother came to faith later, right? Right? And so the, the issue is when you have unbelieving people in your family, they won't believe you, they don't understand. It makes Thanksgiving and Christmas a lot of fun. Uncle Bobby, Aunt Jenny, sons and daughters, moms and dads, grandparents. Jude 11 tells us a little bit more, and let me dig down 
why is Cain's story so bad? Jude 11, or Jude, verses 11 to 13, in the book of Jude, we're being told what people who are apostates or unbelievers are coming into the church to destroy it. And verses 11 to 13 tell us simply this about the way of Cain. Hear me out. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. Now, it's a big honor to get your name on a street, right? Powell Way, Plumley Avenue, Doyle-topia, <laughs> right? you know? It's a big deal. But the way of Cain in Jude is telling us that there is a huge road that leads to destruction. The way of Cain is all false religions that are man-made and refuse the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. So it says here, for they pay and they've given themselves to the error of Balaam and they perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are the ones who are hidden reefs in your love feast. A hidden reef. You ever knocked your leg against coral? You know what I'm saying? When you're out on the, right? You're going to go, they're hidden reefs in our churches. When they feast with you without fear, like shepherds caring only for themselves, clouds without water, big deal in the church, but no real Christian life. They're carried along by winds. They're autumn trees without fruit. These are great images. They're doubly dead, uprooted. They're wild waves of the sea churning up their own shameful deeds like dirty foam, wandering stars for whom the gloom of darkness has been reserved forever. Don't make the mistake of thinking that Cain was simply an atheist, right? Cain was a highly religious man. He went to church. He brought his offering. We're told also that Cain is an empire builder. After this, and he has to leave the presence of God, and he goes off, it says that he built cities, multiple cities. Cain's a big deal. He's the picture of Pilgrim's Progress, where Bunyan talks about the worldly wise man. Great advice. Tell you how to make it in life. Don't be too stuck on that religious stuff. Don't get too far in there. People in our families don't have to just say, I don't believe in Jesus or you're a kook, but it's their approach to life. And what do you do with that? So Cain becomes a fugitive, becomes an empire builder, and he is the father of man-made religion. I often think of the book of Genesis from the perspective of what man's religion has done to man. And if you just start with Genesis 1 and it says, in the beginning, God. And do you know what the last words of the book of Genesis are? In a coffin in Egypt. That is the arc of the story of man's best. But the book of Exodus shows God's revelation of redeeming man from a coffin in Egypt. So how does Abel still speak to us, right? We know why his offering was accepted. It was the right offering. He did it by faith. Cain is a wicked man. Cain is the beginning of all false religions. But how does Abel speak to us today? Well, I'm preaching on him. God's fulfillment of that very thing. Abel still speaks to us today. Right here at Hope Bible Church in 2023, he's the, he's the point of our text. His blood cries out for vengeance. That's what God said. Guys, be encouraged on this. This is going to sound a little odd. But Abel is the first believer who is persecuted and dies for his faith, whose blood is seeking vengeance or justice, and it has not been given yet. All these martyrs throughout all these ages, throughout the church age as well. What is God going to do with that? You know, in Revelation chapter 6, let me read that. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal... I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you remain or refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who live on the earth? 
And a white robe was given to each of them, and they were told that they were to rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters who were to be killed, even as they had been, was completed also in the tribulation period. God has promised that justice will come. And Abel's blood cries out from the very beginning of the unjust murders and persecutions of God's people throughout the ages. And of course, he still speaks to us about faith. Abel was saved by faith. He was justified. He was declared righteous by God, not by his own works, but by bringing a sacrifice that pictured that he believed that the Redeemer was coming. And he tells us to persist in our faith, right? Or does he? See, we're going to talk about Enoch in a minute. And Enoch got off the planet without ever dying. Abel's on the planet only a short time, and kapowi. If we get to choose, do I get to sign up for the Abel plan? I'm in on the Abel plan. I mean, I'm sorry, the Enoch plan. Or do I sign up for the Abel plan? What the author of Hebrews is doing with the first two guys is juxtaposing this. There's a guy who lived a very short life compared to the other patriarchs. Abel could not have been more than about 100 years old at the most because Seth is the replacement brother and Adam's 130 years old when he comes. So we know that Cain and Abel were long before that. And so the reality is he lives a very short time according to God's word, and yet he is still speaking in church. And then we're going to get to, in a moment, Enoch, who never died. And yet he is still speaking to us as well. So the reality here is that it is coming. They are still preaching to us, and we are still able to look at the cost that is involved and what is it. In God's providence, you may suffer persecution in your family. You may not have your, believing, your relatives believe. You may be in the case of Abel. Abel was not able to lead his brother to Christ or to the Redeemer. And what seems unjust is this. Adam's the first sinner and plunged us into this. Cain is a murderer, but the first guy to die is the believer. And so the reality is, in our homes, in our lives, the first place of faith is trusting God that our family life will not necessarily reflect the kingdom. And we have to trust God. Abel wasn't asked that, it just was. But Abel faced this terrible thing, and yet not one character in Hebrews 11 would trade the beauty of the age to come against the sufferings in their own family. And then finally, just one other point, it's a little reference point, but this. Abel's actually mentioned in Hebrews 12 also in conjunction with the blood of Christ in an odd little way. And let me just read that really quick because it matters. Hebrews 12, 24 says, And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Just quickly, how is Abel still speaking through his shed blood in this way? He's speaking, his blood is speaking of the vengeance that God is going to put on the earth. The tribulation period, the judgment of God and the, the scrolls, I'm, I'm sorry, the scroll being opened. But the blood of Jesus says, come and be saved. It speaks better to us. It speaks of God's mercy. It speaks of God's desire to bring you into his family. Whereas the blood of Abel reminds us, God is still angry. And unless your, God's anger has been propitiated through the blood of Jesus on your behalf, you will still suffer the anger and the wrath of God, which is demonstrated in the blood of Abel. So what? Now what? What do we do? Here's a couple things to think about, about how this applies to our lives today. First of all, we have to approach God exclusively in the way he's prescribed, Right? That's got to be the first lesson here. If God says to bring a certain offering or sacrifice, do that. How do I know what to bring to God? Just like Abel, just like Cain, we know. Right? Scripture is very clear. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of spiritual worship don't be conformed, etc. We know what we're supposed to do. And so we should follow God's way. But we can only come to God 
through the means he's prescribed. And so I just want to speak to you this morning. If you're a visitor or you're new to Hope Bible Church or you've been at Hope Bible Church but you've never come to the place where you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would encourage you this morning, no, I would exhort you as a brother in the Lord of this. Don't leave here this morning and go to hell. You must bow your knee to the Lord Jesus and accept his terms and admit you're a sinner that cannot save yourselves, that nothing you can do can earn merit or righteousness with God, that you're undone in yourself, and then turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and what he paid the penalty that you and I deserved and trust in him and him alone to save you and you will be saved from your sins and eternally grateful that you did. If you do not bow the knee and you bring God religion and you've come here and worshiping him today but you refuse the blood atonement of Jesus, you are in the way of Cain. And you are lost and you're under the wrath of Almighty God. Our worship of God must be regulated by his word. God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Exactly. God has progressively revealed what he wanted. What God asked of Abel is different than what he asks of you, but it's all pointing to the same person, right? It all points to the finished work of Christ, but Abel was using a credit card on his sins. He was running up an enormous bill knowing that someone was going to come and pay. We, on the other side, are using a debit card. The payment is already made, right? And so in that, the payment is made and we're just from two different sides. When you look at what God has progressively revealed, Abel knew to bring one lamb for one person. But then on the Passover, Israel begins to learn that you can bring one lamb per family. But then the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, you can bring one lamb for an entire nation. And then at the cross in April of 33 AD, you found that one lamb can die for the sins of the world. And so progressively revealed, but always based on the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Point two, if you worship and serve the true God, you will face opposition. Duly noted, Dave. Jesus warned that the world is going to hate you. Please absorb this. John 15. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Just insert Abel's name here and Cain. Cain's the world, Abel's the one. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you as well. If they follow my word, they will follow yours also. But all these things they will do on account of my name because they do not know the one who sent me. And then Jesus warned that the kingdom of God would divide our families. Please remember that. Faith relative to your family is accepting the word of God and trusting it. It is not believing that God is going to save everybody in your family. That's not the faith spoken of here. That's presumption. Trusting God to save everybody in your family, praying like crazy, evangelizing are all things you based on it. But leaving an open hand that says God saves whoever he wants and there's no promise in the word of God that everybody in your family is going to be saved. That is not defeatism. That is not just pacifism. But if we don't believe God at his word, that he's the one who saves and not everyone's going to be saved that we know, we're going to be frustrated because we're going to be angry with God when he doesn't do what we think we in faith trusted him to do. God, I had faith that my children would be saved. God, I had faith that my mother would come to Christ. God, I had faith that this, but you didn't show up, God. I was trusting you. 
But God did not promise that. Therefore, he, it is not faith because God did not reveal that. It might be faith to believe God that he can and that he's working, but it's not faith to believe an individual will absolutely come to faith. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, do you think that I came to provide peace on earth? Well, there goes all our Christmas songs. <laughs> he says, no, I tell you, but rather division. Verse 52. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided. Three against two, two against three. And they will be divided, father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. At the bottom of the thing is, it's not God will not save anybody. I just gave many stories of God saved people in my family. But he doesn't promise me that. And if he doesn't save someone in my family, then God is greater than that. And I must trust him. So if your children love Jesus and are truly converted, the best thing to do is to thank God and him only. Because there are godly parents in here who did everything they could, humanly speaking, who are sinners, who did the best they could, and they have unsaved children. And then, and there's nobody I'm going to reference here, but there are parents who are professing Christians that don't do a good job at all. And they end up with like Jim Elliott as their son. So Abel still speaks to us today. You know, speaking of Jim Elliott, he affected an entire generation of missionaries. Uh, he and Elizabeth Elliott and Roger Udarian and Nate Saint and all of those, but martyred for their faith, 1956, in Ecuador. And an entire generation of people were affected by his faith and trusting God. And so I think of Steve Green's song. You know who Steve Green is? For anyone here under 40, you're like, it's a guy who works at a deli in Baltimore? I don't... <laughs> but I'm reminded of his song, Find Us Faithful. Let me quickly read a few of those lines from that. Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly lives. After all our hopes and dreams have come and gone and our children sift through all we've left behind, may the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we all must find. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Abel still speaks. Well, if you go with me then to verses 5 and 6 quickly, I want to quickly hit our character Enoch in preparation for next week. Verses 5 and 6 say this, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith... It is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Who is Enoch? Really quickly, and we'll make some comments here in preparation for next week. Well, Enoch is one of two men who never died in the Bible, right? There's Enoch and Elisha. Very good. God took them. Abel was murdered. And Enoch gets raptured, but both of them please the Lord. Again, you can sign up for the Enoch plan out in the foyer. And, uh... So my idea of faith begins at home, and I want to leave you with this thought. In Genesis chapter 5, it tells us this. Now Enoch lived 65 years and fathered Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years and he fathered Methuselah and he fathered other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. I see that faith possibly began for Enoch at home 
just as Abel had to deal with things, and let me do that quickly. Enoch, for this first 65 years, it says he lived, but not as a believer necessarily. But from the point his son Methuselah is born, until God raptures him out of there, it says that he walked with God for 300 years. What happened? I think it's what happens sometimes to young parents who are professing believers or attending church, and they have their first child. And they're like, did anybody get an instruction manual? Like, what are we supposed to do with this kid? And then that feeling comes over you. We're responsible for their soul. We need to do something. We need to go to church. or We need to read the Bible. And it can change a parent when God begins to speak through that, can't it? For whatever it's worth, I look at this and I see that Methuselah's name means his death sends. Seems to me this is what might have happened. You've got Enoch, 65 years old, he has Methuselah, and God speaks to, Methuselah, uh, to Enoch, explaining him that a flood is coming, that a worldwide judgment is coming. He's to name his son this name of basically at his death, it's going to come or it's going to be sent when his death comes. And Methuselah is the oldest dude in the Bible, and we all know that Methuselah dies the year of the flood. It's very possible that this walk with God that was so brilliant was that Enoch is seeing that there's a future that God has promised and has told him this is going to happen. And though Enoch himself gets raptured out before the flood happens, it's possible that he believes that. We also know that Enoch is a preacher. And that is, we're told also in the book of Jude, that he is a preacher who preaches of the end time judgment of all the ungodly people having their ungodly sins taken care of by God's judgment. It's possible, and I think very possible, uh, uh, practically possible, that Enoch knew that when he named his son, he did so by faith, and he knew that God's judgment was going to come on the earth, and he began to walk with God more closely. Well, that's where I want to pick it up next week together, when we do Enoch and look, Lord willing, at Noah and how their faith relates to our lives. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for your kindness to us in Christ. We thank you for the blood atonement that our communion and our baptism are simply symbols of what you have done and picture of what Christ has done for us. May we, like Abel, trust you and our families to live a righteous life, to bring you the sacrifice, to trust in Christ, even if others do not. And Father, may that be used by you for your glory, the good of your church, and the good of everyone here. And we thank you in the name and through the blood of Jesus. Amen.